typically don't have locks on our lockers. There's no rule about that, but we just typically don't need it. Uh, we really don't, don't mess with each other. We, um, almost every student has a locker in this building, but uh, we don't have quite enough for everybody, so we have some lockers over in the other places as well. Uh, but we can take a look at uh, a couple more classrooms. Um, this is all of our faculty and staff here. Uh, we've got 50 full-time faculty and staff members, um, and then we also have a couple of uh, part-time, um, well, full part-time teachers, which really means that they only teach one or two sections. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, our teachers here uh, only teach four classes, uh, which means that they have right around 80 students for the school year. Uh, and that's that's one of the big, you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, ratio, student-teacher ratio. Ours is at uh, 11 to 1 right now. Um, but the bigger thing is that idea about only teaching four classes because I know students, like an English teacher, for example, they, they know those students really well. And when they're, you know, grading their papers, for one thing, they only had 80 to grade as opposed to 180. Mm -hmm. But they really remember those students' last paper. Uh, they, they know their, their strengths and weaknesses, their tendencies. They can give them meaningful feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and even just when a student writes a teacher with a question, they have a little bit more time and it's just sort of emotional space and energy to write a paragraph back instead of a couple of lines yeah. and really be able to engage with every one of those students in a really different way. So that's, again, one of those size um, pieces that is really important to us to maintain, which is why we're pretty firm about that about that capacity. Uh, you know, uh, we don't want to become a school of 400 and then lose these pieces that have been so important to, to who we are as a school. Right. So, um, I'll show you a couple more classrooms. I mean, these are English classrooms. Right? So, yeah, everyone's just starting to get settled in the first period, but, um, but again, you can sort of see a very similar setup, just tables and chairs. And One of the things that uh, is, is very true here is uh, uh, a lot of writing, <laughs> pretty much from the get go, um, and a lot of rewrites. You know, so they, uh, I think, really within the first two weeks of, of the school year, uh, our ninth graders were writing a paper, typically just a personal essay, uh, but really starting to, uh, to wrap their heads around. Uh, how to structure arguments and things like that. So we really hit the ground running. But to get into this, one of the things that has, that's really been true is uh, even for the students who really don't like writing, they will graduate uh, uh, efficient writers. <laughs> We talk about it a lot, but a lot of times, your first interaction with your first mother and your wife is all about it. At least I have hair, you can bring it. Very, very good. Here we can head upstairs and we have our science and health class. We got to swim upstream a little bit. Excuse me. So these are, like I said, uh, science classrooms on this side. We have our main art classroom here, which we'll take a look at. Um, I just wanted you guys to be able to see one of the So this is, we have uh, two, two classrooms that are pretty much identical. So this is uh, Actually, we have our faculty meetings in here on Monday mornings. So we we do a delayed start, so we start at 9:15. Every other day, we start at 8:30. Um, but that's so that we can have our faculty meetings on Monday morning. And I was actually sitting right there and didn't notice this giant jar of uh, giant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like right at the end of the meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thank <laughs> you. 
But I think most teachers just prefer to have uh, a table set up either for discussion or for group uh, kind of like you can see here. Has this class started? It is starting right now. <laughs> uh, there's no bell or anything? Mm -mm. No, we don't have bells. Uh, so yeah, it can be a little disorienting for the Christian students. But, yeah, yeah. But, but then it's interesting, sometimes you're in the hallway and she's just this deluge of, of students coming out and saying, oh, must be, class must be over. Um, the schedule does take a little bit. Um, the schedule does take a little bit of getting used to because it's a, it, we do a modified block schedule. So did you guys get a packet from us? Yeah. Like, so in there, there uh, in one of those information sheets, there's a, a breakdown of the, of the weekly schedule. Uh -huh. So every day is a little bit different, but um, we basically meet in uh, for each one of your classes. You'll meet in that class for more than five days. Uh, one day you won't have a class, and then one day you'll have a double hour and a half period. So like biology, for example. Um, that gives you one day a week to do to do a lab with your giant crickets or whatever. Right? These a little bit more time, um, and then one day you won't do that. We wanted to maintain because, like Carmel High School, for example, they do uh, the alternating blue and gold days. So they, uh, which means that uh, unfortunately, sometimes if there's a long weekend, you might go four or five days without doing algebra and then come back and take an algebra test. So we try to maintain a little bit more regularity while also sort of plugging in the, the block periods. So. Um, so, yeah, so this is, like I said, we have this classroom, another one that's identical, uh, right next door for chemistry, and then a smaller classroom that just has basically lab tables, which is usually for our upper level science classes, physics, and astronomy. Um, and then right across the hall. So this is our main art classroom. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Crowley actually is, uh, for the longest time, he's teaching science and math, but then on the side, he's also an artist. He has uh, a lot of sculptures. Uh, so he's, he's had some commission around town. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me have your attention so now real quick, please. Now the third subject that he's teaching here. <laughs> We offer so again, the grids, if you have deep scratches, we ask you to take a lower grit sandpaper, lower numbers, could be lower numbers, 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 lower Deep scratches this go is, for, I believe it's like, we've got 150 in there, uh, I think it's a textiles class, yeah, so there are a lot of different 120, yeah, you might be staying in there. Photography then, once you get all the big scratches out, to polish it up, that's when you start <laughs> removing the higher numbers, the 200, the 400, <laughs> 800, and you can get it wet. There's a stained glass class. The black that, stuff will um, say wet or dry on the back of it, probably. We aren't offering this year, but it will certainly So you can sprinkle some water, water on the same paper and on the wet side. Wet back here in students, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody lost okay, any that's fingers. That's <laughs> the higher number is not going to take out deep scratches. If you want the deep scratches, don't use higher numbers. For a, for a deep scratch? Uh, no, get something. At least one of these. Yeah, you kind of get a sense of the typical size of a person. One twenty in here. These are pretty. The ones that, that we've seen so far are pretty standard. Some actually get really small. Uh, like AP Spanish literature and like four kids in it. <laughs> they, just, they actually use a conference room just sit around the table together and you know, talk about Don Quixote. Can we hear um, a little bit of the color? Yeah, absolutely. 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 Absolut
we have another smaller art classroom over on the corner here, uh, sort of tucked back away. Uh, it's usually We have our community meeting every day. It's also where music and theater is. It's a good way so we can I know it doesn't look like it, but we actually can all fit in here. There's <laughs> 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 only, a, only a couple of people standing in the back of the room. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, it's a community meeting is a 15 minute meeting every day, so usually five to 10 minutes of announcements. Uh, so anyone can make an announcement, whether it's you know starting a club or um, you know there's a call out meeting for the soccer team, or sometimes it's just like I lost one of my AirPods. If you see one around, uh, <laughs> and then uh, with the leftover time, the leftover five or 10 minutes, uh, there are there's time for a student or a teacher. Uh, to give a short presentation so that could be about a new club that they're starting or it could be about a summer experience that they had that they wanted to share um, or sometimes we'll have or one of our teachers or administrators will take that time every once in a while to talk about you know maybe one of our core values if you know if we've had a couple of things going around the school that we don't really want to be happening we'll bring that up and we'll have a conversation about it you know and and, uh, and talk about why why these things are important to us. We talk about current events, you know. So when um, uh, when the Russian invasion first happened, uh, we spent our Dr. Vesper, who's uh, our associate head of school, and he also uh, teaches physics and astronomy. He's been here for almost 20 years now. Uh, it was also a brigadier general in the Indiana National Guard, so he came up and sort of provided some context, you know, so that we could all sort of better understand what was what was really going on. Uh, uh, really from you know from uh, from all points of view um, so this really is a special time this is one of those things again that has been uh, community meeting is one of those things that's been happening since the school first started uh, and it's really important to us to be able to continue to do it the way we do it um, are there dances in here too yes yeah so we do uh, <laughs> I just prom see the disco ball yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we do usually like a uh, in the past, there's been a fall dance and then a spring dance. Um, uh, sometimes there's a winter formal. Um, and then our prom, everyone is allowed to come, come to prom, so you don't have to be a junior or senior. So a freshman, can, you, you could conceivably go to prom all four years. Um, that is usually off campus, so we've done it at like uh, the Bridgewater Club or, you know, they're usually, at, it's at a sort of a nice place, but it's always, it, we always have, remind everybody, this is very much a school event, so our school rules apply and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, but, um, but we typically don't have, we, you know, I, I don't mean to try to tell you that like, this is some like utopian society where nothing ever goes wrong, <laughs> but we usually don't have, don't have too many issues at the same time. 350 teenagers <laughs> yeah. things happen but, you know, uh, but that's reality yeah. <laughs> so I mentioned that uh, some students will have their lockers over here uh, these are much smaller <laughs> than the other ones but you get the top and the bottom uh, if, you, if you do good stuff with the locker huh. we do a, um, a play in the fall and then uh, usually a musical in the spring and our athletics, a lot of that can be fun. Um, even if you've never done it before, if you've never acted before, you can still be a part of the play. You might not be cast as the lead, but you get to have a, as long as you're willing to put in the time and the effort, and you get to be a part of the really anything that you want to. Um, so, uh, so it really is neat, because you get a lot of students who maybe never had an interest in theater before. I mean, we've had students who have been in that play, and then they start doing the tech stuff, and by their junior and senior year, they're like, they are the point person, you yeah. know, for, for all that, like the tech or the lighting or sound or whatever it might be. So, is, is, uh, what about playing an instrument? Are they, um, is it you, mandatory to try an instrument? You, you do, you don't have to try an instrument. What I would say is, if you don't know how to read music or if you've never played an instrument before, being in an ensemble, like, like being in an orchestra, it's probably not going to work, you know, because it's not, those ensembles are not ground up, right? You do have to come in with some kind of baseline. 
there are introductory music classes, so there's like introduction to percussion, there's introduction to music technology. That is, those classes are designed for students who, who don't who are who, who don't have that basic. Um, but usually our ensembles they are smaller. They are smaller, smaller school. Uh, usually 20 to 25 students in each of our ensembles. So we have a wind ensemble, orchestra, choir. And Third beat of the measure of a four C. Here's beat four of the measure of a four C. The pick up. The three beat pick up. Here we go. by the state requirement, which is that before you graduate, you have to take one, P, or one health class and two PE classes. The second PE class can be knocked out if you play a full season of sport. But even if you do that, you still have to take at least one health class and one PE class sometime before you graduate. You can do it during the school year, you can do it over the summer. We're, not that we don't care about PE or anything like that, but we just follow the state requirement. So as long as you check that box, as far as we're concerned, we do have some advanced classes, like yoga, for example, is what we consider an advanced PE class. So you can take this as your second PE class, but you still have to take the regular one at least once before you graduate. This is yoga? This is yoga. Uh, we have we have, to, we have pretty much everything except for football and wrestling, <laughs> um, uh, and like I said, it's all no cut. Um, uh, a lot of our teams are though are are really competitive. We're two A and IHSA, so we can compete against other schools similar sizes. Our basketball teams sometimes play four A schools, um, but uh, uh, but we do compete in the state tournament every year in all of our sports. Um, but. Uh, yeah, we've got, let's see, right now winter is, is the lightest. So we have boys and girls basketball, um, and then swimming and cheerleading are, are pretty much the, the main sports in the winter. In the fall, we have cross country, uh, boys tennis, girls golf, uh, boys and girls soccer. Um, and then in the uh, spring, we have uh, girls tennis, boys golf, um, baseball, softball, uh, track and field. Um, we did have a lacrosse team for a time because we had a bunch of students who were into it and they said, can we start it? And I said, sure, uh, as long as you guys have, have enough. Uh, that lasted for like two years and then the interest kind of waned and so, so did the, the lacrosse team. But, uh, but that's not uncommon, you know, if a student has a, or a group of students that have a real passion for something and they don't have it here, we'll do everything we can to, to like get it started. There are a lot of you know, sort of student-driven activities. In fact, we have a, a uh, uh, mock trial team. We had a uh, student who transferred in for the start of the school year. She had done mock trial at her previous school, was really into it. We didn't have a mock trial team when she came in. Uh, that didn't deter her from coming, thankfully. But, but uh, um, she went around, basically like got the, the thumbs up from a bunch of students who said that they would be interested in it. She's, she worked with the teacher and now uh, they have a sponsor. Actually, it's her dad. Uh, and now they, um, uh, I think in the next couple of weeks here, they're going to get that off the ground and actually going to be able to compete like, with other 
elementary school. So, yeah, like I said, that's that's pretty common for students to, if they've got the drive for something, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing our part to, to, to foster that. Is there a teacher sponsor of the my child? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, any club has to have a, a faculty sponsor, mm -hmm. um, but usually, you know, you could ask any teacher here, and if, uh, especially if you said like a, I don't know, like I, I, I don't know what to do. Like, can you please help me? Like every teacher. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there a pool? We don't have a pool. Um, How do they do swimming? Uh, we use the. Um, uh, there's a facility over. I think it. I think it, the facility is over in Zionville. I actually haven't. I haven't been there, so I'm usually uh, coaching in that time. But hey, John. Hey, what's the swimming facility that we're using? Hellflex. Hellflex. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah. So they will uh, schedule a time for them to be able to practice every day. Um, for a while, they were doing like the really early morning practices, like 5:30. Uh, but we got a better sl better time slot now yeah. to use it. But yeah, uh, but yeah, they compete uh, still with uh, like you know, with a lot of other schools in the area. So, and you know, usually in every sport, like swimming is individual. I coach our golf teams. Um, it's not uncommon for us to have individuals. Uh, it's hard to get teams out because like golf isn't classed, and we have Carmel and Westfield in our section. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, um, it's not uncommon for individuals to make it out. Like I've had uh, golfers that have made it to the to the state tournament. Uh, actually, won uh, last year finished 11th overall in the state. Uh, uh, so we've got you know even being a no cut system, we still have some students who are really uh, dedicated and passionate about their sport. Basketball teams have been pretty strong over the last couple of several years. You look at him. How would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And we don't, you know, we don't have football, so we don't have like Friday night football games. Mm -hmm. So really, you know, we get a lot of student interest, at, like to go and like spectate, like especially like home soccer games, home tennis matches. Um, but basketball in the winter time is really the, the time when most, like the, the largest amount of students get really excited about. So we get really good student turnout. At there's like a fill the stand yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah do, I think yeah, I do went to that. Yeah, and we have a yeah the students. Uh, we have a couple of students who run uh, like our student like spirit group, so they're constantly like doing like we're, we're going to do theme night just to try to get as many people out as possible. They run their own like Instagram page and all that stuff. So, hmm. so um, we could head, start heading back <laughs> this way. Um, it's a it's a small school, so the tour doesn't take long. <laughs> um, but uh, do you guys have any other, any other questions? So, so in January, uh, all of our students take uh, one class all day for three weeks. So this is when we come back from winter break. So um, they're usually topical classes. Like this year, actually, uh, myself and two other teachers were teaching on a class about golf. Um, there have been classes about specific periods in history, or there is uh, like film classes, uh, that, and then. Uh, there have been many culinary classes, which, as you might imagine, are very popular. So we've had like uh, the history and practice of cake decorating. Uh, you know, um, uh, there have been uh, just sort of like general cooking classes, uh, and these are uh, you know this goes on the transcript. They get a grade, they do projects, they take tests, they write papers. Um, but you're doing it six hours a day uh, for three weeks while you're not taking your other classes. Um, so anyway, we have used that for uh, for a lot of those cooking classes. But they we're actually going to like use a couple of facilities nearby and like uh, actually do some practice, but then also spend some time talking about in January. In January, <laughs> yeah, there are some good indoor facilities. <laughs> um, but uh, but a lot of the time we're going to be uh, talking about, and it'll be for our class, and this is somewhat common for January term. It'll be a little bit Socratic in terms of like we're going to explore this idea together. So one of the things we're looking at is golf is has been and still is in many ways a country club sport, right? You there are the, the, the vast majority of people who play golf are, are like come from one sort of part of the world I would say, you know. Um, how but they have been making efforts to, to, to make golf more accessible, right? Like what does that look like and, and, and what has the effect been? So that's some of the stuff that we're gonna kinda of research together uh, and sort of uh, begin to draw our own conclusions. So that's pretty common for January term classes. That's one of the neat things about, you know, pressing pause on all the other classes and just diving as deeply as you can into one topic uh, for, for three weeks. Um, it is exhausting, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And do any of the students change in midway or are they? Not for January term. Yeah. Um, just because if you think about it, it's six hours a day for three weeks. So it's basically an entire semester crammed into that three week period because that's the only class you're doing. So if you get halfway through, if there is an, a real immediate need for whatever reason to change, of course, you know, we, would, we, would, we would make that work. Um, but really, uh, we, uh, we try to make sure that you're committed to that class. One of, and you can sort of, from a student's perspective, you can look at it two different ways. One, it could be like, I love golf. I've always loved golf. This is the class for me. I'm going to take this class. Or we actually have some students in the class who, I have never played golf before. I have no idea what it's about, but I want to check it out. You know, so uh, you get sort of get in everywhere in between. Um, so the, you can be real exploratory in, in your selections for day time, or you can um, uh, sort of follow something that you that you've really had a had a passion for uh, for a while. So mm -hmm. it's a fun time. It, I mean, honestly, it's uh, for a lot of students. They would say it's their favorite. It's their favorite time of year, which is interesting in January. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, it's something it to brighten is, up the January. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and it's, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, any other questions that you guys have? Yeah. Hope this gave you a little bit of a sense of the, of the campus. Where do kids meet lunch? And we have a flat surface policy because too many crumbs were getting worked over the carpet, so we have to sit at a table or a ledge or something uh, with your lunch. But really, just about anywhere. Um, you know, so and uh, students can use the lunch program and order their lunch, or I would say maybe maybe half of our students do that, and then the other half uh, would bring their own lunch or microwaves if they can use it. Where do they get their lunch if, they're if they order, order it? Uh, over, actually over in the kitchen. So we, we don't make food in there, we just have food in the kitchen. Okay, yeah. so if they go over there to get it, uh -huh. yeah. they order and Then they can eat over there, they can bring it back over here. Uh, it's, again, it's uh, sort of their, their time. Uh, uh, we are, um, I know it seems loose, but uh, we really do we'll keep tabs on students because, you know, usually we don't have students that like wander over the last part you know, supposed to. Um, and during study hall, yeah, I mean, and not that it, again, 350 teenagers over 22 years, that <laughs> still yeah. happens, but, um, but uh, uh, you know, during study hall, for example, if a student wanted to go outside, it's perfectly fine. We just ask that they, because they need to sign in the study hall at the beginning of the class. Everybody needs to, no matter what. Um, but if you want to go outside, you can just let um, Ms. Davis at the front desk know, just so that we can make sure we're keeping tabs. Partially because we need to keep tabs on everybody, but also um, you know, if somebody pulled the fire alarm, we have to we have to know where everybody is. We have to do a little count for everybody. Um, so. Um, but again, that's uh, again. I think the benefit of having a small school is it's a little bit easier to keep tabs. Oh, you know, well, well, here at home I think they saw Riley Hassman. Oh, really? Did you say hi? Riley, Riley Hassman. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say hi? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's a friend from Orchard. Oh, awesome! Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so, um, but anyway, we did for that school year. We did hybrid uh, every other every other week. Uh, like I said, we were pretty firm about students can keep their cameras on, um, and you know, it's not the same. But all things considered, it worked pretty darn well uh, to be able to keep everybody engaged. Um, and it was really kind of sad because students were, you know, when they were here, they were in such a good mood, and then like when it got to Friday afternoon, and be like, ah, yeah, I just don't want to have to do virtual next week. You know, they really wanted to be here. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that was the situation we were in. Um, and then uh, following school year, then we were, we were back in person. Um, they were, you know, when things ramped up a little bit, they were, we had the infrastructure so that if we needed to go hybrid for a couple of weeks, we could do that without disrupting the, you know, the, um, uh, the teaching tools. Uh, so, um, so that was, that was really nice. Hopefully, we don't need to do that anymore. Now we just have nice TVs in the classroom. But, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that I think all things considered, I was genuinely, I was really, really impressed with, with how things work, with the work that our administrators did, with the flexibility that teachers and students have, and everyone was, was ready to hit the ground running. And so I'm like, okay, let's do, you know, let's do this. Uh, and, um, you know, not to say that I don't like. I think everyone experienced learning loss, you know, during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was. I think it was. Yeah. And, you know, 
we're still still doing everything that, that we could to track it. You know, so if somebody will, we, you know, like math teachers, that's what the most important part. It's so hard. We actually, yeah. uh, you know, uh, sort of divert like, somebody's curriculum to make sure that they were going to speed and not just saying, oh, no, you have to retake geometry. Because that would So, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure you've noticed we're wearing masks, and I've seen yeah. Yeah. three students, I think, yeah. who yeah. are also wearing masks, mm -hmm. and several um, yeah. staff members. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's been true for uh, quite a while now. I think when we first came back, fully, we actually had a lot of conversations about that, that, like, some of us will choose to wear masks for very good reasons. Some of us will choose not to wear masks for very good reasons. Um, and because you might have a particular belief about that, um, make sure that you're not um, allowing that to change the way that you're thinking, thinking or talking about another person and that you're doing something. Because uh, that was actually, interestingly, that was a that was a big source of anxiety, I think, for a lot of people. It's like, it's, you know, because I, I was wearing a mask constantly during that time. Like, I remember having that thought, like, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to, like, make other people nervous by not taking the test. And, and it was hard, hard for me to decide, like, when was, when was, you know, it's, you know, it's okay for, you know, for me in our situation. We also have two young kids at home, so it's like, if I don't get it here, I'm going to get it at daycare or something. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so I think that, um, that has not uh, has not really been an issue for us, and, we've, and, and I think partially because we had those those conversations early on about, about this is this is your choice, and you can make this. Choice. You should try to make sure that you're well informed about all this, but then you can make the best choice for you know, the situation. Now I know with like the, the triple blank, or even uh, I think uh, some folks are, are being now being more cautious even than they were. Um, yeah, we're not contact tracing anymore. Uh, we were just sort of following the state guidelines, um, but we still do. If somebody, if we know if somebody that, that is positive, we still do inform like that teacher, we make sure like you know uh, uh, any students that that that, that student they would say, you know, just that that they know. And again, we have, we never really needed a contact trace because like it's wrong. We're like, yep, she sits right there. I know he sits next to her. <laughs> so like, if we need to let them know, like, we can do that pretty much. So, uh, yeah, any other questions that you guys have for me? Um, so I don't know. Oh my God. They must have gone over to lunch um, then, or? That, uh, just no, just the timing of that. So the students are all, all heading to the different classes now. Uh, oh. So, uh, yeah, so these students have recognized a couple of the orchestra players who are making their way over here for the class. So. I just wondered why Audrey went over there, maybe. Maybe she has classes. Yeah, that would be my guess. Uh, could be could be health or PE um, oh. that meets over there. There also is one overflow classroom over there. Um, which I, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head where this is here. But my guess is that they're probably letting go health or, or PE class over there. Uh -huh. yeah, um, what about uh, students with ADHD? Is there mm -hmm. uh, any kind of provisions for them? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, particularly if a student has a IEP or 504 plan. Um, you know, that's something that we will usually take a look at with the, with the family uh, in the admission side, just to make sure that we have the capability to... to uh, uh, he doesn't have a plan. Sure, but, yeah. but, but, you know, but we have a lot of students... Because he's not in public school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. But, you know, we have a lot of students who, you know, uh, who may have, um, you know, like an ADHD diagnosis, that, but they don't have this, uh, you know, individualized learning plan or something like that. Um, a lot of times what we'll do is, is you know, work with that family just to figure out, you know, what, and work with the student too, but, um, are there things that we need to make sure that we have in place, whether that's just letting the teacher know that this student might need to, like, stand up every 10 minutes or so and just, like, go and blow their nose even though they don't really need to go blow their nose just because they need to move. Um, or we have some students who, you know, particularly for people with a lot of anxiety, they might need they might need to get up and leave the classroom, you know, uh, once or twice, uh, and, uh, uh, and making sure that that 
teachers aware of that, that they can accommodate that. Um, and then, uh, and sometimes, you know, like 14 to 18 is an interesting time, so things change quickly. So we, uh, we have a director of learning support, and then, like I mentioned, several learning support staff members who are constantly working with, with our students in, in the learning support program. Um, and constantly just kind of evaluating and seeing where we're at. Are the things that we're doing, is that, is that effective?